what um, what were your favorite uh, uh, sermon themes? Um, what uh, when 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 you came down, what did you? Uh, and the the subsidiary question is, then is uh, what occasions did you best like to deliver a sermon? When when did you feel that uh, uh, you know the 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 time and the place and the message just really came together. I guess uh, the uh, the sermon area, the sermon themes. I would have to say would be the sermons post Easter. Uh, and the sermons usually were drawn from either the Gospels, but as much as possible, I would try to draw my sermons around Jesus saves. I can't think of anything better for a pastor to get up and preach about than the sayings of Jesus because all of those are so significant and so meaningful and they are the sign of the communication of the gospel and the way in which we should help each other and serve each other those were sermons I never hesitated to preach on if I possibly could. I, uh, in one of my assignments for the church, had to do a considerable amount of preaching at uh, the, the first sermon of organizing a church or something like that. And those were the sermons I liked. Because they had to, to make them up, you had to make them up so that they had the distinct quality of wanting the church to grow, wanting the church to move outward among the people. And the people, it was the people who were involved in that ministry. And one of the admonitions to churches, if I had any admonitional sermons, was uh, the church must be moving, always moving. Uh, what causes it to die out is when there is no movement in the church. When there is uh, no exercise of wanting new communities or new kinds of people who may be coming in and serving in the church. And, uh, well, that's most of what I have to say about that. Do so, you know it's amazing? Your, your voice and your mannerisms as you're answering that question I could see in the pulpit. I mean, it's it, it, it was just, uh, yeah. I mean, that was the fervor that you brought to when you were when you were at the pulpit. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, in, a, in a way, and, and this might sound strange, but uh, for, for a, a generation at least, and my experience growing up, is that um, that was... How ministers were taught that you rooted the you rooted the message in the gospel yeah. and uh, it's it's funny yeah, because uh, uh, back then they called it the Old Testament reading and then the next one was the epistle that's and then right. the next one was the gospel and the that's sermon right. all the, almost always came out yeah, of the gospel. The gospel. That's right. Um, but uh, you know that's the that's the central is that. Uh, uh, the, the Gospels contain those stories and they contain the sayings. And uh, yeah, the Jesus stories and the Jesus admonitions, all of those, you know, are taught in Sunday school. 
really, Sunday church school is where I learned those. And that's what uh, I guess I would have to say. Caused me to say, I want to be a pastor someday. I want to be a minister. <laughs> but um, I, I, I remember years ago, I was at a um, convention of community colleges. And there was, they brought in the, the main speaker. And uh, he had all kind of wisdom. But the uh, thing that uh, I walked away with, he said that every successful uh, college uh, president needed two things. And one was uh, the, the, the gray or the white hair for the proper look of experience. Yeah. And the second one was they needed an advanced set of hemorrhoids for the proper look of concern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it was, uh, uh, when you would go up to the pulpit, it was like there was, there was a hush over, over, over the crowd because it was the, um, uh, just the uh, experience and the authority that you brought to the practice of ministry um, was, well, was very impressive. I'm not sure about that, but I, all my life, there wasn't a time when I didn't enjoy being a pastor. And I guess uh, even though I had a lot of excitement and uh, possibilities in the work I did for the whole church at various, you know, two or three occasions. That is, uh, periods of time. I nevertheless liked that business of preparing a sermon and trying to have it together by Thursday morning. <laughs> by trying to have it together by Thursday morning so that I wouldn't have any of these last minute uh, nervous periods about am I going to get this done or not? <laughs> I didn't always achieve that, but many times, most of the time. <laughs> but actually, that, that, raises a, that raises a connected question because... Uh, People say, well, you shouldn't ask the chef for the recipes on uh, how, he, how he makes up the buffet. But um, I, why, don't, why don't you uh, talk a bit about how you um, prepared your sermons, where, where you look for, uh, in addition to the gospel, um, you know, where you look for for your inspirations, for your, for your ideas, and um, uh, how to connect the, the, the time, uh, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago at that point uh, with today. Yeah. Well, uh, that's not always easy. That's perhaps one of the more difficult things of being a pastor. <laughs> I would first try to determine what the situation is. And believe it or not, there are situations almost weekly in congregations. That sort of shaped the conversation of that day. Now, not always did I go to that conversation, but things that might surround or stay stabilize. And uh, that, uh, that didn't always happen, but it could many times. And I tried to find that out. The other thing is, there was a period of time when I would be asked to preach frequently at the first, uh, at the uh, opening of a congregation. And I tried to know enough about that location and the people in it so that I could develop a sermon that would uh, that would uh, be meaningful to them. And so uh, you don't want to go to a church in Washington, D.C., two miles from the Capitol, 
and preach the sermon that you preached in Lower York County the week before. That places are different and the people are different. Now, the sermons can carry the same message, but they are worded differently for different occasions. And I try to, uh, to look at the location and to look at the time where that people, that group of people were in their ministry. Even my own congregations. Uh, to develop a sermon. And I tried not to do it Sunday after Sunday in a way that became a bit troublesome. But uh, but uh, uh, it's the people and the message that need to be. What are some examples of when you felt that Boy, I really get it this time. <laughs> well, I think that uh, some examples, uh, at least I can think of a couple. Uh, I, uh, in Berkeley, we had uh, a lot of professors in the congregation. We had, uh, oh, in one of the, in the congregation that I was the primary pastor, we had 19 theological professors. Well, you, you uh, take some time to prepare the sermon because you know the listener. And on that one Sunday morning, I think it was uh, one of the Sundays of Lent, uh, I was preaching a sermon and two of the institutions were having conflicts. So I thought uh, a week before, dare I dare I touch on any of this? Because after all, we have members on both sides of the issue. Well, I decided to brave it. And I preached a sermon that I thought would bring both sides together. Well, after the service, I had uh, the person whom I, who many people tell me, was the best professor of New Testament in the church. He came to the door took my hand and stood and didn't say anything. He looked at me. And he said, Ken, you did the right thing. <laughs> oh, I thought, my goodness, here is this professor telling me that I did the right thing as I was speaking to both sides, really of an issue that was taking place in the university and the seminary community of that town. Uh, and uh, I tried to do that many times, but uh, didn't always uh, uh, receive that kind of a reception, maybe, but uh, nevertheless, I did. And uh, I don't think that a pastor they miss those opportunities. Because if you're preaching about something totally unrelated and the sum and substance of the sermon doesn't really touch 
something in the community or in the community of people in that congregation. Then, then it's not a sermon. Richard has described uh, on some occasions the immense amount of time he devotes to the various visitations that, that he does. And uh, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, uh, you, you wonder how he has, finds time to do all the other things he has to do. Um, but the, um, you know, the, the stories he tells of rising out of that uh, undergirds sermons sure. and, and, and everything else. Um, uh, do you have found uh, stories from visitations that you made that uh, really moved you, that uh, uh, perhaps deepened your faith? Oh, yes. Uh, many of the visitations I made deepened my faith. Let me use an example, and I please understand, I'm not using this example because I think he's a famous person. But um, we had in our congregation in Redmond City, <clears throat> a person who during the Second World War had been an advisor to the Defense Department. He was an advisor to the Swedish Defense Department. He was on church council. One day, he we had a council meeting, and he happened to be chair. But I knew he was in Sweden, and I thought, who are we going to get to chair? Because the vice chair didn't have all the necessary qualities to chair a meeting, at least to. To move ahead. Well, lo and behold, the meeting was at seven o'clock. At quarter seven, in walked the chairman, the president of the council. He had been in Sweden. He came back for that meeting. The next day, he flew back to Sweden. Talk about commitment. To take, say nothing about the finances. Let's say he had all to spill. But the fact that he would take the time and the counsel would be so important for him. That illustration was used on numerous occasions. I'll talk about being concerned about your responsibilities in the church and to carry them out. And you know what? This congregation here, Tree of Life, one of its great strengths, in my judgment, is that people with ability people with concern carry out the responsibilities that they've been asked to carry out or volunteer to carry out. I have hardly seen a congregation where the people who accept the responsibility do the work like a tree of life. Have there have been occasions where people have said to you, um, I've been away from the faith for a while. Um, I've, uh, I've started to have doubts or there have been difficulties in my life that just gave me a different perspective on things and you've helped bring me back. Yes, there have been people. And uh, particularly in congregations where, in several congregations where I had served for a period of time, uh, that, car that was especially true in a congregation in Pasadena 
that I served. We had uh, three or four members of that congregation who were very active in the community of Pasadena and not always on the same side. And uh, so uh, I knew that. And I called three of them together and said, now we can fight or we can serve. And it's got to be one of the other. If we fight, let's agree to come together. We don't always need to agree. But we can do some things that will be positive for this congregation. In that congregation, we had a request came to me one time. They said, you don't seem to have enough time to deal with all the issues we have in sermons. <clears throat> Why don't we have a period during the church school hour where you lead discussions on issues? And I said, well, you're going to have to make some promises. We will have a church school hour and I will, I will lead that church school hour. Even though I have to do other things in the congregation. And during that church school hour, we can argue and disagree, but at the end of the hour, we're friends. Now, can we do that? If we can do that, I'll agree to take up the issues, all of them that you bring. And we did it. We did it really for a solid year. It was the last year I was there. Unfortunately, I would have Enjoyed it for three more, but we did that, and we had we had real fights <laughs> on issues. But it was a way of getting at issues and being truthful at the same time to our own feelings. And uh, I uh, brought those into the sermons at times. Those issues and would speak to them. But uh, it can be a testy thing. <laughs> we count on our ministers for a lot. And uh, uh, you know, when we, anytime, anytime we run down a checklist of, of things that, uh, okay, what do we want from our ministers? Uh -huh. There's a dozen big items on there, and that uh, there, there could probably be several subsets of each of those major <laughs> items. But um, I think that we tend to sometimes forget that um, they're human too. Yeah. And uh, so, so the question would be, um, how how do ministers overcome their times of doubt and disillusion and discouragement? Well, as you can see today, we don't always. We don't always overcome them. But when we do, it is by several things, staying with people and staying with, with Scripture. I, when I had doubts and I did many times. Or one would, it would come upon one, let's say. But uh, all 
always scripture was connected with my beginning to feel whole again. And I, I think it's as simple and as complex as this. It's always going back to the stories of Jesus. Even the simple ones that children seem to understand. Those are the stories that really get at the heart of how we live with one another. And most of our deepest problems are with another. And how we live with one another are, are the, the ways that uh, we can be helped by the stories of Jesus. And many times, I would go to those simple stories, not only when I was in a congregation, but we would have some pretty tough times with people in the last position I had in the church. And that position was the division for mission in North America, which is contained in new mission development urban mission, uh, work with social ministry organizations. That can be an interesting thing too. Uh, that work with social ministry, developing social statements, how one must keep from really getting heated when you're developing social statements. Oh, and uh, more than once during those periods of time, I had to check myself. Check myself and go to the simple stories about, like the one in which Jesus tells us how to help each other. I know on one occasion, and this may have be helpful in another part of, of your of our discussion, but on one occasion we were presenting a social statement to the church convention. And when I was in charge of that area during that period, I was the principal person on the platform to discuss those issues before the assembly. Well, we got had a tough session in one of the assembly discussions. It was the one on war and peace. And uh, I had uh, one of our staff members in one of our private sessions after the principal session with the convention. I uh, had, we had discussions how we prepare for the next assembly session and so on. And I had one staff member say, if I hear President so and so, I was the president of the Senate. Say anything in this next session, I'm going to walk off the stage. Well, I had one choice. I said, Well, if you walk off the stage, keep walking. Because that's the end of our discussion here. We must work with this old church to develop this statement. It's going to be the church's statement, not your statement, not my statement. It's the church's statement. And it's only because it's the church's statement that it's yours and mine. 
Well, that's not a bad session. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, it gets difficult. And I thought to myself, I had a long thinking session with myself after that, because he wasn't the only staff person who was angry. And I myself was angry at times at some of the dumb things that major persons in the church could have said and shouldn't have. But nevertheless, we got themselves. <laughs>